All right, AP World, I'm um, just going to get you a little bit of an intro going here, maybe just like a, a slide or so, uh, just to get this uh, this unit rolling. This is, uh, as I told you, um, this is a, a lot to cover in just a, a single unit. Um, basically taking on just, um, <laughs> I don't know, the, the hot mess that uh, the 20th century is going to become. Yeah, you can quote me on that, okay? Um yeah, this this is going to be um, well. You know, I think the the topic, uh, the unit name, pretty much lays it out there. Uh, this idea of conflict, um, where this is just going to be a century where we just see this. I mean, you know, in, increase in technology. We're going to see the nuclear age, you know, born during the twentieth century. Uh, you're going to see all of these challenges to kind of the you know, the political order. Uh, whether it's uh, pushing back on imperialism, whether it's going to be you know, uh, the rise of communism, we're finally going to see the Ottoman Empire finally, you know, after five units, uh, finally is going to uh, is going to you know leave the stage. We're going to see uh, you know the kind of the the reemergence of a a powerful China. I mean, it is just uh, change, change, change uh, is is the name of the game uh, with with this unit seven. And um, and like I've talk, kind of told you guys before, it's it's almost I don't know. It just it feels like it's a setup for disaster. There's so much to cover, and so um, I'm gonna get like I said a little bit of an intro here, and then uh, and then I'll get these in the notebook because we're gonna jump in this uh, <laughs> fresh tomorrow and uh, and and get a little bit more of it taken care of. All right, so. Um, we're going to uh, start here in section one uh, that is going to uh, kind of take a look at uh, kind of the, the picture of things uh, right here as we make that turn of the century into 1900. And uh, actually where they're going to start us off is going to be in, uh, in Russia. And, uh, and, and really the theme is revolution that's going to take place early on uh, in, the, in the century. And, and they kind of put things a little bit, I don't know, the time chronology here is, a, a, in, in my estimation, a little messed up because technically this revolution is going to happen um, during World War I. And World War I is going to play a really strong, major role in, in triggering the revolution in Russia. Um, but they decide to tackle this as revolution. So we're going to look at revolution and change in Russia, and then we're going to look at it in China and, you know, take a little bit of that approach. So there'll be a little bit of bouncing around time-wise uh, as we uh, work our way through this. Um, let's see, the uh, the big picture here is going to be of uh, Russia. Um, you know, where, where we last really spent a lot of time talking about Russia was, you know, back during the days with Peter the Great and, you know, his fascination with the West and wanting to uh, kind of drag Russia out of its old, you know, kind of serfdom and, and all that sort of thing and modernize. And um, and while he gets that process started, things in Russia happen very, very slowly. Uh, they don't, you know, I mean, it, it takes, what, another 250 years or so after uh, Peter dies before the, the Russians actually legally abolish serfdom. Um, yeah, everything is, is pretty slow. And because of that, by the time you're getting to the 20th century, although Russia has made little moves, you know, we even talked about them in the Industrial Revolution, you know, the Trans-Siberian Railroad and things like that. They don't, you know, they don't, they don't shun the Industrial Revolution, but they are still a country that kind of sees their strength in kind of their agrarian, you know, agricultural uh, kind of kind of past. Uh, that they're that they're still, you know, a, a nation of farmers. Um, but you know, a little bit of that industry that, that is kicking in, um, really that's where I'm going to put that in there is they industrialize, but only in a limited sort of a way. Okay. They're, they're not going to embrace the industrial revolution to the degree that you're going to see those Western European countries or the United States go after it. And so while they're not going to take a position like, you know, say the Ottoman empire or China, where they really just kind of almost kind of shun it. Um, they, they don't, they don't dive in deep enough. And by the early 20th century, it's really starting to show and, you know, just significance and difference in terms of just the, the modernity of Russia compared to, uh, the rest of, of Europe. 
Uh, they are still also under the, uh, the rule of a very, very tightly run autocracy. The Romanov family that Peter was, uh, you know, part of is still in power in Russia going into the 20th century. Uh, by that time, they are ruled by the guy you see pictured there, Tsar Nicholas II. Um, he is a guy that, um, you know, if you kind of look into his story, probably really didn't even want to be czar. But, uh, um, you know, as these autocratic families, it's kind of it's what you're born into. Um, but even though he was a, a pretty kind of a kind of a mild meat kind of a guy and, and not too serious in the job, uh, he still understood what the job was. And, and the job was to have a very much a top down government that allowed their people uh, hardly anything in terms of individual liberties or rights, freedoms, you know, all of that that, you know, we've been talking about, you know, even as we've been kind of doing some LEQ work with the Enlightenment, natural rights, all of that, none of that exists in Russia, okay? They have been resistant through the Enlightenment and, you know, all the, the revolution movements. Um, Russia has pretty much just doubled down on that's not the way we do it here. And, uh, and so going into the 20th century, that is still where, where things are at, right? And, uh, and yeah, um, modernization, it's, it's really hit and miss in Russia. Uh, infrastructure, you know, there's still large parts of Russia that are kind of just, you know, dirt roads and, you know, that kind of thing. Their education system lags behind the rest of Europe. Um, and, and so there does seem to be, you know, if you look in some of the urban areas of Russia, turn of the century, they seem to be fairly modern, but you know, that's just in the urban areas. And when you get out into the rural parts of Russia, where a good portion of the population lives, you know, that's where you feel like you're walking back a century or two. And, uh, and so, you know, th those are all things that are going to be working against uh, Russia going into the early 20th century. All right. And so uh, some consequences to look at here, the, the kind of the problems that are going to uh, come out of this. Um, you're going to see some early signs. Uh, Russia will end up in a war uh, that, that kind of, uh, well, some major foreshadowing of 21st century uh, politics, but uh, the Crimean War uh, involved uh, the Russians, uh, involved the, uh, the British and the French, and, uh, and it was a war that, uh, that Russia ended up losing. And, and so, and, and you can see from the time frame there, we're talking fairly early on in the 19th century, uh, but was already, you know, starting to show evidence that even though this is a massive country and it's got a big military, uh, it's an old fashioned military. And, uh, you know, even by the 1850s, it's beginning to show that uh, these Western European countries are starting to distance themselves in terms of the kind of technologies that they're using in the war. And then um, and then they end up fighting a uh, another kind of like the war that that Japan fights with uh, with China. These are small wars and and uh, involve, you know, some some of it is naval and a little bit on land. But these aren't like massive wars of invasion or conquering. Uh, but uh, Russia and Japan do end up going uh, to war uh, early 20th century, uh, mainly over uh, territorial claims. Uh, some of the islands and and that sort of thing off the uh, the coast of Russia that uh, are contested. You know, Japan says they belong to them. Russia says belongs to them, and uh, they end up in a war. and And most betting people would have said, okay, you know, Russia, big old Russia, um, who has done some industrialization, they're probably going to win this thing. But no, no, the Japanese win. Uh, or at least fight the uh, the Russians to a standstill, and then uh, the war is ended uh, and ends up being uh, kind of basically um, just kind of settled peacefully uh, from there. Uh, but but you know again, it's an, it's another piece of evidence that uh, that that obviously there are things going on in Russia uh, that, that things are not healthy and uh, and and problems going on. Now I should mention that year 1905 that's mentioned there. There is a uh, there is an attempted revolution in Russia that happens that year and basically kind of a popular uprising where people are uh, just kind of, you know, wanting their, their rights respected. They, they want more representation in the, uh, the Russian government, uh, those kinds of things. It doesn't end up being a successful revolution. Nicholas, the government's able to tamp it down, but it's also evidence that, that in small ways, you know, things are kind of beginning to slide uh, beyond their control. All right. 
Uh, like I said, now, now we throw things kind of really out of out of chronological order because um, a couple of, well, I should say a few years into World War I, uh, Russia will jump in early on into the war. They're in as soon as the war starts in 1914, and Russia's experience in World War I is going to be pretty disastrous. Um, big, big armies, but uh, poorly led, poorly armed compared to the German army that they're going to be fighting against, the Austrian-Hungarian army that they're going to be fighting against, and, uh, and, and Russia is going to just bleed out troops uh, over the first couple of years of the war. Um, Tsar Nicholas will make a, a fateful mistake uh, during the war in personally taking command of the Russian armies, thinking that, you know, that they just, that the troops just need to be properly motivated. And if they know their czar is leading them, you know, that'll change their fortunes. It doesn't do anything. And instead it just kind of shines a spotlight on the fact that uh, Tsar Nicholas maybe isn't all that he's cracked up to be. Uh, and so, you know, he's kind of beginning to lose control of his government. Uh, the war is going poorly. People are turning their backs on him. Basically the, the walls start falling in. And in 1917, uh, there is a revolution that, uh, and, and basically a popular uprising. Uh, people, women, everyone just rising up uh, against the government. And, uh, and, and Tsar Nicholas, uh, when, once he realizes that, uh, that he has no longer has the support to continue on, uh, he abdicates. And uh, what takes over in his place is a temporary attempt to try to piece together more of a kind of a democratic representative type government. Um, it is in power from about March of 1917 when this revolution goes down to about October of 1917. And in October, that is where Vladimir Lenin and a group called the Bolsheviks uh, will uh, launch a second revolution. And this one is to bring down this temporary government and put the Bolsheviks, who, who are communists in terms of their political philosophy, put them in charge of Russia. And that second 1917 revolution will be successful for uh, Lenin and, uh, and the Bolsheviks. Uh, and so at that point, uh, going into 1918, um, Russia will begin this transformation into the first communist nation uh, you know, on earth, okay? And, uh, and we, will, we will catch up with that story a little bit later on about how that will uh, kind of play out uh, going going forward from 1918. Alrighty, um, but before we do that, um, hold on just a sec here. All right, but uh, next year we're gonna we're gonna take a, a quick look at China, okay, and uh, catch up a little bit with them. Um, kind of like uh, Russia going into the 20th century, uh, a lot of kind of upheaval uh, going on in in China as well. And if you think back to you know what the way that we've kind of been working with China and going in into unit with, with unit six. I mean, it's been tough times for China, you know, uh, whether we're talking about uh, the opium wars, whether we're talking about, you know, spheres of influence created by uh, European powers in the United States. Uh, we've got all kinds of problems that are stacking up against China. Um, a lot of those, those problems will begin to, uh, to flip over and, and act out as, as ethnic issues within the country. And, uh, you know, as the Chinese people start to, uh, in some cases, almost kind of like, you know, pointing the finger at each other, you know, who is to blame for this mess that we are in. And so, uh, you know, some of it is a little bit more internal. Um, also because of this constant upheaval. Uh, whether it be political, whether it is internal issues, whether it is foreign interference, uh, you're also starting to see kind of this, this combination of, of a population that is continuing to grow, but a struggle to, to be able to keep food at, at a rate to where you can feed the population. And, uh, and you begin to see parts of China, especially as you get a little bit more into the rural parts of uh, China, uh, into Western China, Central and Western China, you're starting to, uh, to hear about, you know, outbreaks of, of starvation, of famine, uh, as food shortages become a, a reality in some parts of the country. And, and it is, it's just a, a direct consequence of, of the issues that are going on. OK, uh, you also have the fact that uh, the, the dynasties through most of, of, of China's existence, you know, typically try to keep the, the taxes, the tax burden on their population as low as possible. 
And and that is something that has continued even as we go on here into you know the final dynasty uh, that is that is operating the country. Um, and while that while that certainly you know makes that aspect of life a little a little easier uh, for for the population, the flip side is is it provides a little money for the government to have to spend on things like modernizing or you know infrastructure even. And so uh, China is going to look uh, going into the 20th century like you know like I described parts of Russia. Uh, feeling like you're going back in a time machine to, uh, you know, decades or even centuries uh, in the past. All right. So, you know, those are some of the, the problems. And then again, you also have, you know, these other issues that are going on. And some of these, you know, again, connected to their relationship with other countries. You know, we, we talk about already that, that China has had this long history of these isolationist tendencies. You know, this, this, desire to just kind of want to, to, to just kind of be on their own, you know, and just please the rest of the world, just leave us alone. Obviously that has not been a very successful policy for them because, you know, you've got all these European countries, you've got the United States that have been kind of basically sticking their nose, you know, all that influence that we, we talked about, uh, in, in unit six, uh, creating, creating issues, uh, for China. And just kind of like we will see in Russia, uh, it does not take long into the 20th century where this is going to boil over into a popular revolution. And this revolution is going to take place in 1911. Uh, it's going to be led by the, uh, the gentleman you see pictured there, Sun Yat-sen, who to, I suppose you'd have to say to, to like people in maybe like, uh, Taiwan. It's maybe probably not so much in uh, communist China, the People's Republic. But Sun, Sun Yat-sen is almost kind of like seen like they're like they're it's like George Washington to them, uh, because he is going to be a guy who has spent time in the United States, uh, is very much impressed with our form of government, wants to bring a version of that to China, and he is able to build up enough of a base of support. Uh, to uh, to launch a revolution, and in 1911 they overthrow the dynasty and establish a, uh, a democratic based government. Um, it's never going to quite replicate what we have here in the United States. It's going to go a little bit sideways, um, but you know, especially when Sun Yat Sen is alive, um, there there is an effort to try to to come up with you know a, a Chinese version. Of, of democracy. Unfortunately, Sun Yat-sen is going to die not too long after the revolution. He, um, and he ends up with cancer and, and dies of cancer. Uh, the leaders, uh, and the main leader that we'll learn about later on that takes his place, kind of has a little bit of an issue going back and forth between democracy and maybe a little bit of, he has some autocratic tendencies that he's always fighting against. But the, the 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 big takeaway there, you know, the big I guess break in history is that is it. That is the end of all of these centuries and centuries of dynasties that have ruled China. They will never come back again. Uh, well, at least not up until you know twenty twenty three. They have not returned, and so you know that is a huge game changer in terms of you know when we think of examples of major change. So we can you know, we can look at Russia, major change. Uh, centuries of the Romanovs gone, uh, and you know the introduction of the first communist government, right? And then in China, we can think of these. I mean, boy, dynasties going back to almost, you know, I mean, before our curriculum even started for this class, there were dynasties, and now they're gone. And so already, uh, in this unit, you know, boom, we're already getting significant major change. Okay. All right. 20 minutes. That's going to be good enough for us. Next time we jump in and we're going to be doing this in class. Um, we are going to, we, we're going to kick back in with the good old Ottoman empire. All right. Um, but that'll cover us for now. Thanks. And, uh, next time back.